Good afternoon, my name is Diana Gutierrez and we are here at the Fox Theater in Pomona. Hello everyone, my name is Kristen Peterson and I'm here today at the Fox Theater in Pomona for the 80th premiere of King Kong. We're gonna go inside and check it out, let's go. guys, it's Kristen here again. We are here with the life-size hand of King Kong. This is his gorilla hand, real gorilla fur right here, and his mighty hand. Um, and they have this piece of artwork brought in for all the guests who are coming to watch the movie. They can snap a quick photo. So now it's my turn to take mine. I have met a young fellow, he's 14 years old, his name is Christian Lopez. Have you gotten to uh, take a photo yet with this gorilla hand? No, but I am getting ready to. Getting ready to, alright. Back to you guys. Hi again, my name is Diana Gutierrez and I'm with Frank Deeds. Um, a question I have is, I heard that you did a documentary, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, my partner Trish Geiger and I, uh, last year did a documentary about a man named Bob Burns who actually owns the original King Kong from 1933, the armature, which is about 18 inches tall. And he brings that armature around to various conventions and everything, gets it, lets everybody hold, hold it. And, you know, while we were making that documentary, we were thinking, wow, you know, everybody wants to touch and be part of King Kong. Mm -hmm. And started thinking about, like, what is it about King Kong that everybody seems to love. So we decided to do a documentary that would explore the legacy of this character, why this character has endured for so many years, 80 years to be exact. This is his 80th birthday. And do you see any similarities or differences from the original film and the new version of the film? Peter's version is wonderful um, and rather faithful to the original. Um, but, you know, I think m for most of us, our hearts will always be attached to the original Kong. Yeah. 1933 one is just such a gem. It's, it's, it really was the very first epic film. I mean, that, that had sound and actually the first movie that was actually scored from beginning to end. It actually had, they actually had a composer uh, Max Steiner create a score from the beginning to the end of the movie. It was never been done before. Um, that special effects had never been done before. I mean, it, it was such an amazing achievement for its time. And the proof of it is, is that it's held up through all these years. I'm happy to be here today to celebrate the eighth wonder of the world and happy to see so many other people are here to do the same. Alrighty, then thank you so much, thank Frank. <laughs> Hi guys, it's Kristen again, and I'm here with Gary. He came today to the Fox Theater for the 80th premiere of King Kong. Gary, why are you interested in King Kong? Well, I'm a longtime fan. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Pomona, and it's for cancer uh, survivors, so I thought it was a good, good uh, program. And who is your favorite character in King Kong? Uh, I like the ape. The ape. He likes the ape. Did you hear that? <laughs> All right, thank you very much, and enjoy the show. You too. We appreciate those of you who stuck around because the show is really only half over. Um, we have a wonderful panel discussion and we have some very special film surprises that you'll learn about. So at this time I'd like to introduce our moderator for the panel, Scott Esther. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Are you guys been having fun so far? Yeah. How about that lobby exhibit? In the, in the lobby, we have to acknowledge some people, so the wonderful sculpture of Kong that's sort of sitting on the bar in the middle where he's holding an airplane was done by Mr. Brent Armstrong. Give him a nice hand. Stand up, Brent. Stand up. The uh, wonderful uh, 
David Allen exhibit with photos and some things from the movie, and then the sculpture that's in the back where Kong's sitting there with sort of brown fur was brought by the proprietor of Dave Allen's archive, Mr. Chris Endicott. Give him a nice hand. And then one of the other cons who's sort of leaning forward was brought by a fellow who um, is not in attendance actually. We borrowed the item and it's uh, from Greg Nicotero and he also made that wonderful movie we saw before Kong called United Monster Talent Agency. So I'm not saying for him. Okay, and now we're going to discuss the movie in a short panel and then we're going to see some wonderful additional things on screen. And right now I'm going to bring out the people who will talk on our panel um, to discuss this wonderful movie. Just personally, for me, I've always loved the movie. It was about a guy from New York who liked the blonde, so I just sort of related to the movie. So anyway, uh, without further ado, let me bring out the first fellow. He sculpted the shorter Kong piece that's on the side with just Kong's head, and he's done a bunch of wonderful sculptures, and he's a sculptor, and creator of many statues and beautiful artworks, Mr. Mike Hill. Our second panelist brought all the wonderful photos from uh, the making of King Kong and related items. His father actually co-wrote the book, The Making of King Kong, and uh, he was nice enough to come and bring archives from his father, Mr. Doug Turner. This next fellow uh, is a monster maker, a creature creator, and makeup artist. He's done, oh, some little movies you might not have heard of, like E.T., The Extraterrestrial. He's responsible for the look of E.T. He did another little movie called Poltergeist, and he created all the makeup effects in that. And The Gate, and The Dreamer of Oz, where he recreated The Wizard of Oz, and on and on it goes. My good friend, Mr. Craig Reardon. And last, there's no one else back there. Lastly, he is the documentary filmmaker and editor who created the piece that we're going to see shortly about Willis O'Brien, who's the chief technician behind King Kong. And this has never before been seen by the public. So you'll be the first public audience to see this film. We're going to show a piece of it. And uh, in the future, there might be a full-length version of this film. Let me bring him out. He created the film and edited it. Mr. Steve Austin. <laughs> and with that, we sit. So, let's go down the row here. Uh, this is the first question that's on people's minds when they talk about we have a King Kong screening in 2013. And the question is, why? After eight years, do people still like this movie? Why do they still treasure this movie? Why do they still care about the character in the movie? The question is why? And everyone seems to have a different reason. Let's hear from our experts why this movie is still, to this day, an icon in, in American pop culture. Mr. Austin. First, okay. Uh, I saw King Kong first in the theater in 1971 or 72 when it was re-released as the restored version, uh, which included the scene where he pulls uh, Ann Dower's clothes off and sniffs them, and uh, I had not been seen in many years. And when I saw it, I was about 12 or 13, and I was just blown away. I was knocked out by the imagination of the film. The, I read about it in this magazine called Famous Monsters for many years. My copies were tattered to pieces because I had never you know, experience anything like that, and I just looked at it over and over and over. And um, it was the stop motion, aside from the story, it was the stop motion and the miracle of it, which I didn't know what it was all about. So that just took me into further investigation. People at the time didn't know how they made this movie. Still, you look at some of the shots and some of the scenes, and you wonder how they did some of this stuff. I mean, in 1932, when they were doing this, they didn't have computers. Nothing like that. They had photographic process shots that they have to do in optical printers. And this was very time consuming, very laborious, and very difficult work. So to make it look good, much less to pull it off, it, it was very, very difficult. Steve mentioned that uh, the, the King Kong tearing Darrow's clothes off. 
An important note about that is, when they made the film, obviously they shot all those scenes. But from 1934 until 1968, there was something in place called the Hayes Production Code. Does anyone know what that is? It was a censorship body which censored films. So from really mid-30s until much, much later, in the late 60s, those scenes were cut out. You didn't see Khan pulling her clothes off. You didn't see Khan putting people in his mouth and stamping them into the ground. All those scenes were cut out and later restored, obviously, for home video, which didn't exist when the, when the code was in place, and for TV screenings and so forth, and DVDs. Let's talk to Mr. Reardon. Why, why Khan still 80 years later? Why, is, why do people like it? Why are we here? Let's see if this works. It works. Uh, I think, uh, summing it up, uh, King Kong is the all-American monster movie. This is uh, our gift to the entire world. And uh, it's the biggest and best monster movie ever made. Uh, we had already seen in 1933, not that I was there, but we had already seen an adaptation of Frankenstein, Dracula, taken from literature, legend, but these were kind of life-size monsters. This thing came out of left field. And you've got a gorilla that's 50 feet tall that winds up on a modern building, having come from an island populated by dinosaurs. Uh, it's, it's, you almost have to deconstruct, which is a word simply meaning, take it apart and look at it laying on the table in parts, as it must have seemed to people that came to see this when it was new. It, that's amazing enough that these re almost ridiculous concepts worked so beautifully uh, in the day, and they still work. And I think that the reason that people like it today as much as, as I do, because I'm the same as all of you guys, I'm a big, big, big fan of this movie, is it is it's just it just is like a locomotive and it's honest straight from the shoulder wonderful uncomplicated dialogue uh, uh very very kind of square cut believable characters there's nothing fancy about these guys you you understand what's on everybody's mind you <laughs> because they say it and you just go from point to point to point to point. And if there's anything that's going to be any, any slightest bit boring or tedious, they fade it out and fade back in. So we're going on this expedition, bang. They're, they're at sea, bang. And they see the island, bang. They go to the island, bang. You know, uh, it, 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 there's nothing quite like King Kong, I think, either in its just preposterous notions or in the style in which it's executed, and the unbelievable grandeur and detail of what these men, you know, came up with. Uh, I may have occasion to talk again, and I don't want to usurp the stage, but uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about the influence of the craftsmanship of this movie on myself and people in my field and of our generation. But I want to give somebody else a chance to speak, so I'm going to see the microphone. To, uh, dub, uh, to dub this. It, it, Craig makes some excellent points, and what's interesting is of when he described it comes from an island of dinosaurs and so forth. In 1933, there had been nothing like this. As we'll see in the film, uh, Willis O'Brien had done a movie called The Lost World in 1925, but that was a bit different. The animation might have been a bit cruder, it was a silent film, etc. Um, so King Kong was unprecedented, and when it came out, it was like, what is this? People were just amazed. And like, some people had said that this film was going to be a dud. It's coming out during the Depression, it's violent, etc. So uh, people weren't going to see it. The 12,000 people were turned away during the first week of the Kong in its premiere in New York because of its incredible popularity. A big smash hit, unlike anything that had come before it. I was lucky enough to ask three people who saw the movie in 1933 what that experience was like. The f two of them have since, had, since passed away. One was famous Monsters of Filmland creator, Morris Ackerman. I got to ask him about that, and he went to see the movie at Grounds Chinese in Hollywood, and uh, saw the big giant Kong head out front. Uh, the second fellow who saw it then was Ray Bradbury, very famous science fiction author who has also since died. And the third guy is still alive. Unfortunately, he doesn't travel to this country anymore because I believe he's about 92 years old. But his name is Ray Harryhausen. 
and Ray Harryhausen worked with Willis O'Brien on Mighty Joe Young in 1949, but then he created all of his own amazing films inspired by King Kong, such as Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and Jason and the Argonauts, and later films like Clash of the Titans. So this, these three men said that there was absolutely unlike, Kong was unlike anything that had been out at that time, and still to this day, as Craig said so eloquently, there's nothing like it. There's really nothing like King Kong. Just a quick thing, there were two other Kong films, right? 1976, they did a version, and then 2005, they did a version. But without getting too much into those films, they didn't, surely didn't equal this film, and there's no way they superseded this film for many different types of reasons. And the fellow who probably knows more about this film than anybody, his father wrote the book, The Making of King Kong. If my father had written the book, The Making of King Kong, I'd be jumping up and down in the bedroom the whole day. His dad wrote the book. My dad was a dentist from New Jersey. <laughs> Mr. Doug Turner, why is King Kong still, 80 years later, and in the memory of your great late father, why is it still an icon in America? Well, one of the main reasons is that it's just a great movie. It's fun, it's exciting, it's dramatic. It changed the way musical scores and films are done. It uh, is paced so well and structured so well, they still use the same structure for films today. Um, getting the slow start and then building climax upon climax till the very end with no real time to catch your breath. It's still a, it's still the way we do action movies for the most part. And it just has such memorable scenes, the iconic uh, calm on top of the Empire State Building. And mostly it's just fun. My father was seven years old when he saw it uh, at the premiere at the Hollywood Theater with uh, Kong's head out in front, and it, uh, it basically changed his life. It uh, affected you know, what he did for the rest of his life, just like he did with Harry Housen and with Forrest Ackerman. And uh, I grew up with King Kong, so I don't remember the first time I saw it. We used to watch it in 16 millimeter on the uh, on the wall in our living room, and it was it was our favorite film growing up. We want we want to watch it uh, every couple of weeks. And one time when we we started to run it, the sound went out on the projector. So my dad did all the dialogue and music and everything <laughs> just, uh, spontaneously. It, it was very fun. We used to play uh, we used to play King Kong out in the yard. We, Turned on the hose one time and made our own little swamp and ran through it. So it was, it was lots of fun growing up with Kong. It was, it was also fun because my dad knew many of the people that worked on King Kong. So we had uh, a visit from Orville Goldner who did uh, a lot of the miniature uh, jungle settings and buildings and animated some of the birds and other sequences. So he came by the house and one time we went to visit uh, Mario Baranaga in the studio in New Mexico. He did matte paintings and uh, he was Kong's personal makeup artist, getting, getting Kong ready for the scenes. And uh, got to talk to the director on the phone one time, so it was, Tom was kind of like my big brother. <laughs> Audience members, raise your hand if you have a program book that you got when you first came in, the King Kong program book. Show of hands, if you could. And then the balcony, if you didn't get one, please pick one up before you go, because you'll see in their photographs of King Kong playing here at this theater in 1933. It was here in May of 1933, and that giant head that we keep talking about was here in the, in the front of the theater, on, right there on 3rd Street. You can imagine what the traffic was like going by 3rd Street in 1933, seeing this, what, what was, what's that? This giant King Kong head. 
And of course the film had opened, and the reason we're doing it this month, it had opened in March of 33. So this is the actual 80th anniversary of this month, and then two months from now will be the 80th of when it played at the Pomona Fox Theater. And please do get a program book and, and check through it. There's lots of nice little photos and facts and figures in there. And of course I encourage you to further explore the making of King Kong, which they can still purchase, correct, Doug? The making of King Kong, it's still available. The yeah, book, it still can, can be purchased. You can still find it. And it's also been revamped and expanded in a book that's uh, still in print called, called Spawn of Skull Island. Excellent stuff. Look for it online or at bookstores near you, which, whichever of them are left. The last gentleman on the end is a, a true artist and I think genius. Some of his sculptures are so lifelike you think you're looking at a person, not a sculpture. And he did a beautiful King Kong that's in the lobby. Mike, from your point of view, as a sculptor, why, why is King Kong still an important film to us? You know, I think that you said earlier that the world had never seen anything like King Kong back in 33. Well, I believe that no one's ever seen a movie like Kong since, you know, 80 years later. Um, asking what King Kong means to people like us, and I like to call people like us the sons of Kong because we do what we do because we saw this movie as a child. Unfortunately, I wasn't quite as lucky as Doug. My dad didn't write the book on King Kong, but he did steal the book of King Kong from me from the local library when I was, um, when I was four years old. So, yeah. um, and I still have it. I still have, I still have the book. It was actually a 1967 comic adaption of the book of the, um, of the Lovelace novel. And, you know, it's so hard to say what King Kong, you know, what perhaps is about King Kong, apart from the fact that it is King Kong. It, um, you know, he belies the imagination that this 18 inch tall puppet, you know, inspired all of us and we believe that it was a real creature. And, you know, just the pathos when this animal is trapped, because that's what he really is. He's trapped, he's, he's at the end of his tether, he's tried to save the woman he loves, he's at the end of the Empire State Building, he's got nowhere to go. And we finally see his eyes start to droop. And I think for all of us watching it the first time, we suddenly realize, you know, this wasn't a monster. The monsters were the people gunning him down. Cal Denham really was, a, was the monster. You know, Kong's the anti-hero. And as soon as his eyes start to droop and we feel that humanity, I think that's when we all fall in love with King Kong. And uh, that's when I fall in love with him in sense. And the other attraction to me, guys, I'm sorry, but it's Faye Ray, you know? Um, she, yeah. Faye was my first crush. Um, and, you know, um, and she was known as the most beautiful um, lady in Hollywood back in 33. And she's, to me again, she's still the most beautiful lady ever in Hollywood. And um, yet she wasn't even the first choice. Jean Harlow's first choice was one of the first choices for playing Anne Darrow. And also... Um, Const Constance Bennett. Yeah, Cooper's wife. Uh, Cooper's fiance at the time. Dorothy Jordan. Yeah, she was also a blonde because they wanted a blonde. And um, Faye was obviously a brunette. She actually was wearing a wig in the movie, a uh, wig she chose herself, I believe, from Max Factor at the time. But anyway, I'm, I'm digressing here. I, you know, it's King Kong. I don't have a better answer than to say that, you know, he, he's, the, he's the king of all movie monsters. You know, I love Frankenstein, I love Wolfman, all these characters, but Kong is still the king. Excellent. They, they mentioned a man named Cooper. Did you guys hear his name mentioned? Marion C. Cooper was probably the person who is most responsible for the movie we end up seeing. He was a very big personality. He produced this film, he directed it. He was larger than life. It's kind of hard to compare someone today to him, but you might think of someone like, say, you know, in his time, a Steve Jobs, right? A big, larger than life, media-friendly personality. And what's funny is the other two films based on this con were made by similar personalities. That a man named Dino De Laurentiis was a big, grand Italian producer who brought the 1976 con. And then eight years ago, Peter Jackson, you know, big, makes the Lord of the Rings films. And he's, everything was big and bold. And maybe that speaks to why the films are like this. Um, this fellow Cooper really saw that there was an opportunity to make something unlike a movie that has been made. 
and the attention to detail and all the scenes and the vision of this island and, and climbing the Empire State Building, a lot of these things were uh, Cooper, certainly with many, many collaborators, one of which I want to talk about right now. The unsung hero in the film is, in, as he's credited here, the chief technician, and his name was Willis O'Brien. And the man to my left made the documentary that we're going to see an excerpt of soon about Willis O'Brien. For the uninitiated, who was Willis O'Brien and how vital was he to the success of this movie? I think that he's at least 50% of this film. And 50% of the reason that a lot of us are up here on the stage in the craft that we're in is because of the inventions and uh, imagination of O'Brien. Basically, uh, he was a person who, around the turn of the century, went from being a, uh, a runaway and a cowboy and a fossil hunter and an Indian scout in the great, you know, Northwest and uh, ended up in little enclosed rooms in the dark pushing around puppets. It's an interesting dichotomy, but his imagination, the expanse of his imagination never left despite how his environment began to shrink. And um, Brian, to me, I mean, I call him the father of American stop motion animation. There were uh, European people who were experimenting at the same time, but I don't think he was aware of them or they of him at that time, which was around 1915. And um, Brian basically, I guess he was just like a dinosaur man, like most of all of us, you know? And, but he found a way to make the dinosaurs come alive, and also to humanize Kong, of course, and I, I think that just watching the film with, I don't know how many people were here tonight, but it, it, it just occurred to me, when Kong climbs on top of the T-Rex, and people go, yeah, yeah, we, we know this is a puppet, and it looks like a puppet. It's not moving smoothly like a real gorilla. This is, this is a real character. That's despite the, the technical uh, advances that we've made with CGI, Khan had life breathed into him through, I've tried animation myself, and it's easy to, to do like a, to get something to walk from one side of the stage to the other, but to get it to a moment, to get it to do the things that O'Brien did, uh, I think it's a really special genius, and they're not, there's a lot more people now that are doing it very well, but at that time, very few, and, and he was the leader. In, in O'Brien's team, there was a man named Marcel Delgado. And this fellow had come up from Mexico and was working in LA at the time. And Willis O'Brien knew he'd need a big team of people to realize his vision for these effects done in stop motion. Delgado is a lot like the man there next to Steve, uh, Craig Reardon, a creature creator, a sculptor, a technician, an artist, crucial to the look of King Kong. And by the way, there's several King Kongs in the movie. I don't know if anyone noticed, but he doesn't look the same in every single shot, right? Some scenes he's got a different head, and then you see a close-up of him, and that's the giant head. So it's not consistent from shot to shot to shot, but the vision of what Kong looks like was, was largely Delgado's. Why was that such a great design for this character? I'm, I'm very happy you broke the subject of Marcel Delgado because I think it's wonderful that, uh, I, I don't remember the specifics, Steve will know the specifics, I'm sure, Marcel is a young man, I think working, uh, what, like, uh, as a laborer, or? Uh, he was in the Otis Art Institute. Oh, I beg your pardon, okay, so he had, he, well, he obviously had the talent, I just didn't know, how, he met, the, did he meet him at Otis then? I'm looking for, I think he's doing manual labor, but. Uh, yeah, they were both with uh, that. In, in some drawing classes, but Delgado was working at a grocery store as his primary. Yes, yeah, so I just, I just, that, that was the aspect I remember. It was, it was nothing related to movies or even art. Marcel Delgado actually making one of those, any of these creatures. I don't know why, but there are, there are very few photos of the setups by which the industry uses that terminology for the filming stage where the miniatures would be placed, where they would uh, array the various little miniature props. Uh, Willis O'Brien had a wonderful idea of giving it a sense of depth by building portions of the set in layers, literally in, in, in series, just as we're sitting in a row here, where Scott is sitting might be the back of the set, so that the big stegosaurus that they first see way off in the distance in the forest 
is maybe where Scott is sitting, and then we have a layer where Steve is sitting, which has more prop, little, little trees and so forth, as well as sheets of glass that talented artists have painted trees and so forth. Then we're also, also set. The dinosaurs also sometimes exit when they're left. Right, so they, they can get them into the next set. Yeah. And then where I am, another layer, and then where the other gentlemen are, until you get right to the perspective of the camera. Well, it works. When you look at these layers, you think that you're in some vast jungle, God knows where. I saw this as a kid, I absolutely believed I was in the jungle somewhere. And there's no question about it, because it's who well, I was. But it wasn't. It was a bunch of tables and little, you know, cut out things and painted glass. It's amazing, huh? I mean, the environment below that they, that they invented for this movie is staggering. It is, it's the sort of thing where you, you don't spend two seconds thinking, what, what, what the hell is this supposed to be? You could have, but you don't. From the get-go, as they land on that island, from the very first glimpse of the island, you're looking at oil paint and balsa wood and who the hell knows? But as far as you're concerned, you're at Skull Island wherever that is, and uh, that was part of the appeal of the movie. You can imagine what, what fun it must have been for 13-year-old Ray Arias to sit there, and Zowie, man, he's in Skull Island, and you know, what's behind that, 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 that those, those doors? That, those were real, really in scale. Those doors must have been 100 feet tall. You know, it's just one holy mackerel moment after another. Uh, I'm, I'm getting lost here in, in my own you know, King Kongs, but uh, the, the craftsmanship just doesn't end in this movie. Everybody was not only producing amazing things that had never been seen before, but also heard. I got, I got to say just two quick anecdotes, and then I want to give it back to my friends. Here. But first of all, I'm going to grab the microphone and tell you these two stories. I actually got to meet Murray Spivak. He's the man that did the sound for this movie. And you think, oh, 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 the sound of the movie, yeah, very nice. Well, it's terrific sound. I mean, everything in the movie, uh, not only, you know, the crashing of uh, doors and, you know, the running, the, you know, all of it, he had to put together. But he also had the not-so-easy job of giving these basically silent movie sections with the dinosaurs and with King Kong sound equivalents. What does a giant gorilla sound like? What, is a, what does a dinosaur sound like? And Murray said that he went to, uh, he interviewed people that were like paleontologists, and, and they said, just speculate, like, what would a dinosaur sound like? But, you know, I, I, I have this job to do. And they said, well, it would uh, probably be silent. And he said, Jesus, I can't, I can't. He says, I can't deliver this to Marianne Cooper. And when they show the big dinosaur, it just goes, <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious to hear him say it. So he, he had to come up with something. So he got recordings of uh, uh, like lions roaring, you know, and he even did things. You know, he did things himself with the microphone. He did things like uh, he told me uh, for Kong beating his chest, was beat the mic on his own chest. He was very ingenious, in other words, and he built all these effects you know, himself. He would take recordings and play them backwards. So that something that might go like wow and make those strange wow wow. You know, you hear when the when the big Tyrannosaurus is fighting Kong. Very, very creative. And then the other guy that impresses all of us, even though we may not be interested in music per se, we feel the pulse and the urgency through this whole film, which is created by Max Steiner who is properly remembered as the father of film music. And he had done, I think, one or two other musical scores, bearing in mind that King Kong came out in 1933, and sound movies were only about four years old at that point. So they had made, basically used music in movie musicals with the girls dancing, you know, and the tunes. And Steiner came out from New York. He was originally from Austria. And he had been very involved in Broadway, so they got these guys out to help them with music and early sound films. And what he said in a late interview was that, he had, by the way, a German, Austrian-German accent. I've heard recordings of him 
talking. In fact, you could hear him talking in excerpts from conducting the orchestra. He's very funny when things would go wrong. He'd, you know, get a, get a little angry and scold the orchestra. But anyway, he said, he said that uh, the studio was worried about King Kong. Now this gives you some, some insight into the business behind it. They'd invested a lot of money. They were afraid the public would think the monkey looked fake. Now they were seeing what we see. You can find defects if you're looking for them, but producers always think it's gonna be a failure. They worry more than anybody. Uh, ask me how I know. I've worked in the business for 30 years. You know, they will double and triple and quadruple guess everything. Uh, so they said, use music you've already got. We don't want to spend any more money on the music. So he said to Marianne C. Cooper, what am I going to play, Little Women? Because he just done an adaptation. So Cooper said, basically, F him. You know, I'll pay you. You write, you write what you want to write. I'll pay for it. That's amazing, huh? And, and apparently he did. I mean, it's, apparently Marianne Cooper wrote him a, a check to compensate him for you know, his, his work and for the orchestra, which is a tremendous leap of faith. But you can see how Steiner's music repaid that a thousand million times over. It not only put King Kong over, so you never really have that emotion that the music communicates with its rhythm and its melodies and all that is, is an immense psychological impetus to draw people in and to convince them that what they're seeing is something actual and uh, that it has continuity and it has a kind of a forward motion and an inevitability to it, uh, including you know the moving qualities. Mike did a beautiful job, of, I think, of isolating the moment where it was well said, Mike, where we see King Kong as a tragic character, and we then we look back at everything we've seen with him earlier in the movie, and we think he's not a monster, indeed. He's 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 macho. He's 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 you know he's a, a he's a he's a character. You might say a man of substance. Part of that's Max Steiner, too, who gives him a certain nobility at the end and a sense of tragedy. And the big chords, the musical chords, as you see this poor thing crashing off this you know, building on the way down. It, it's, uh, you know, this was, this was also brand new when this movie came out. You, they, they never used music and motion picture imagery quite like that before. So, uh, Oh, and I might say too, and then I am going to give up because I've had a lot of talking here. I got to meet Darlene O'Brien. That was the widow of, uh, of Obi. And uh, she was a kick in the ass. She was a lot of fun, a very sweet gal, and she liked, she liked people. She was very convivial. I met her through Ray Harryhausen. He let her stay uh, in his house in uh, Pacific Palisades. She was, uh, uh, she liked, she, on the two occasions that I went over to see her, she would serve you something called greyhounds. Now, I don't know if any of you know what a greyhound is. Do you even know what a greyhound is? Well, it starts with grapefruit juice, but then you put in about that much vodka. <laughs> and uh, yeah, at first it's refreshing, and then it's, then it's quite liberating, yeah. And she, you just got the feeling, talking to her, darling, that, that uh, Obi, Willis O'Brien, was a person who, Regardless of some of the disappointments he had in life, which I'm sure Steve can tell us more about, uh, he, he loved life, he liked to party, he liked, he liked to go to the fights, he was, you know, he, from what I've heard. He also liked to go dancing with his wife, and uh, was a regular guy who, uh, I remember a story that Darlene said that we liked to get Ray out because we thought he was kind of shy, and we, that was Ray Harryhausen as a young man, you know, we wanted to get him out and kind of get him out of that town a little bit, but we couldn't get him up from the table, you know, to get out of the dance floor. It's pretty cute. So, you know, Willis O'Brien was, as, as Steve was saying, not only somebody with an amazing background, but like a lot of early film pioneers, they didn't come from film school, they came from life school. They'd been out there experiencing things, picking up, you know, real impressions and, and uh, adventures and real life and they by god got it on screen so what you see is original because it came out of their experience and their thinking you know, they weren't copying somebody you know 
that's inspiring, particularly at this end of the tether, this way, you know, this long, this far along, it's very difficult to come up with anything new because we're all kind of feeding, feeding off the old movies that we grew up loving. It's a little bit uh, compulsive in a way. And Craig makes an excellent point about how Kong was new at the time as far as musical score. Just to give some of our younger folks here a little context, 1933 when the movie comes out, there's no TV. Radio as a mass medium was still very new. It had only really become a mass medium in the late 20s. Sound was brand new in films. There was nothing at all like this. And in the film that they did of Kong in 2005, 100% of the character of King Kong was done on the computer. 100% of it. In this movie, there's zero computers. There's really zero animation, per se, in terms of hand-drawn animation. It was all done with puppets and that giant head. And when you think about that, at that time, that's kind of amazing that they pulled it off, because it very easily could have looked cheesy or fake or unbelievable or literally devoid of life. And they created this character that we all still love 80 years later. Let's face it, we come back for the character. Some of us come back for the blonde. But we come back again and again for the character. And the fact that it was this tall, Aside from the, the only time you see that giant head is when you're super close up on Kong. So the big max close ups, that's the giant head. Everything else is a puppet this big. If you think it's easy to try to make that feel alive, try doing it sometime. It's not that easy. 